Hello again. This is my second video where what I want to do in this video is explain to you the looking glass self. So if you're looking at those questions on the Google form or you're looking at these slides and trying to understand it just by reading them, hopefully you're watching this video so that you can get a better explanation and idea as to what the looking glass self is. So what sociologists focus on when it comes to self-image is not this. They do not focus on how you as an individual construct your self-image. What they're more focused on is right here, this key idea that your self-image is shaped by other people around you and it's shaped from how you think those people see you. And that's the process we're about to get into called the looking glass self. So what the definition of the looking glass self is, is this is the image you have of yourself just based on what you believe other people think about you. So a lot of us like to think that we're very individualistic and we don't care what people think about us, but hopefully as we go through this, you can start to think of some examples and see how you are constantly trying to figure out what people think about you and you use those thoughts to shape your self-image. So this is actually a three-step process that sociologists have identified and what the first step is in the process is we often imagine how we appear to others. I'll use my own personal example because it's the example that I always use in class. So me as a teacher, I would say that part of my self-image is that I'm a teacher. Um, I am always trying to figure out how I appear to my students. So I'm always just imagining it. I might think of myself up in front of the classroom and as I'm teaching, I'm also trying to think how am I appearing to my students. The second step here is after we've imagined how we appear in front of other people, then we imagine the reaction that they have to that imagined appearance. So once I've imagined me as a teacher, how my students see me, I try to think about what reactions do you guys have to me? So maybe I think that you guys think that I'm a boring teacher, or maybe I'm awkward, or maybe I think I'm more funny than I am. Those are reactions that I might think about. So that's the second step. You want to imagine the reaction that other people have to your imagined appearance. The third step is what shapes your self-image. So once you've completed the first two steps, then we start to evaluate ourselves according to how we imagine other people have judged us. So if I'm imagining me in front of my students and I'm trying to think about the reaction that students might have to me, maybe I think that I'm boring and students just really don't like me as a teacher. That's going to have a huge effect on my self-image. If I think students think that I'm boring, that's going to negatively affect my self-image as a teacher where I might not think of myself as a good teacher because of that process that I just went through. So a few key points about this is this is not a conscious process. And what I mean by that is as you're using this process to shape your self-image, you're not aware that you're actually doing it and that it's having that effect on self-image. And those three steps occur in a very rapid succession. So the first step of imagining how you appear to the reactions to then shaping your self-image can occur in a matter of seconds within your head. And the biggest result of this is, is that you might have a more positive self-evaluation of yourself or a more negative one. And in the example that I used, again, I'm just trying to imagine myself as a teacher, reactions that students have to me. And let's just say that, again, I think those reactions are negative. Well, that's definitely going to have a negative impact on my self-image as a teacher. So this right here will give you another quick example of self, uh, the looking glass self and how someone may use it.
Socialization describes the process by which people learn the attitudes, values, and behaviors that are appropriate and expected by their culture and community. And it typically occurs through the observation of and interaction with the people we are surrounded by. And this could include those who are close to us, like our family, friends, and teachers, but it can also include everyone else that we come across in our daily lives. Our doctors, nurses, celebrities that we see on TV and in the movies, even the people standing in line next to us at the supermarket. They all have something to teach us about how we should act within our community. But socialization also shapes our self-image, or how we view ourselves. And sociologist Charles Cooley used the term looking glass self in order to describe this process. And he theorized that our view of ourselves comes not only from our direct contemplation of our personal qualities, but also from our perceptions about how we are being perceived by others. And Cooley thought that this happened through three steps. First, we imagine how we must appear to others to our families or friends or just people on the street. Second, we imagine how they must evaluate us based on their observations of us. So do we come across as intelligent or funny or shy or maybe just awkward? And third, we develop feelings about ourselves based on our impressions of their evaluations and their observations. And one critical aspect of this theory that I want to point out is that Cooley believed that we are not actually being influenced by the opinions of others, but instead we are being influenced by what we imagine the opinions of other people to be. So this is where I want to stop and just point out this key idea, which is what she just illustrated here. This process is all about you trying to imagine or think what the opinions of other people are. It would be very different if I asked my students, hey, tell me what you think about me as a teacher, and then using those responses to shape my self-image. That's not what I'm doing. I am constantly, and what sociologists are pointing out here, is we are constantly trying to imagine what other people are thinking thinking about us. And we use those assumptions to then shape our self-image. You're not walking up to your best friend and saying, what do you think about me? And then using that response to shape your self-image. So according to this theory, we might develop our self-identities based on both correct and incorrect perceptions of how others see us. So let's say that we have this teacher and they're grading a paper very harshly. They're grading it very critically. And I'm also going to stop it and say that every time I show this video in class, people always say that this is a great example for Mr. Grove. And they're doing this because they think that the student who wrote this paper actually has a lot of potential. And so they're grading that student's paper harshly in order to help them reach it. So let's say our student gets their paper back and notices that it's full of red ink marks and corrections from the teacher. How might that student interpret this? And how might that influence their self-image? First, they might observe that the teacher criticized them harshly on this paper. Second, they think that the teacher probably did so because they see the student as not being very intelligent. And then finally, our student comes to the conclusion that, based on this, they're probably not very good at literary analysis. So here, the student is acting on an incorrect perception of what they think the teacher believes. And because our attitudes can often influence our behaviors, this might result in the student putting less effort into the class instead of more effort like the teacher originally wanted. But this doesn't have to be the end of our story, because it can also be influenced by future interactions. So let's say that the student talks to the teacher after class about why they graded so harshly. At that point, the teacher might explain that they think that the student is on the right track, but that they need to put in a little bit more effort. And so because of this additional interaction, the student was able to revise his or her incorrect perceptions, and this could lead the student to developing a different self-perspective. Last one. Uh, no, we don't want to watch that. Okay, so hopefully that example also helps. And I like how she again illustrates what the looking glass self process looks like. But one thing that she said here that I like is that your self image could be distorted by using this process. And what we mean by that is again, you are assuming 
or trying to imagine how other people see you. And the assumptions that you make may not actually reflect other people's opinions of us. So when I use my example of me as a teacher and thinking that my students think I'm boring, so therefore I might not be a good teacher, that's just me assuming that that might not actually be the opinion of my students. Maybe my students don't think I'm boring. Maybe they were just tired that day in class and took a nap, or maybe they do think that I'm interesting, but I don't know that because I'm not asking them. I'm just trying to assume what they think about me. So the last thing I wanna get into here is we do not use this process with every single person that we come into contact with. What sociologists say is there are people in our lives who we call significant others whose judgments are most important to us. So when you go to the grocery store, you may not be using the looking glass self process with strangers. You may not be thinking of that lady in the milk aisle and trying to imagine how she sees you, but rather you use this process with these people who we call our significant others. So for children, this is most likely going to be family members like their parents, grandparents. As they get into school age, it could be teachers and classmates. But as you get older, the variety of your significant others becomes greater. So this could include spouses, boyfriends and girlfriends, definitely probably still include your parents and family members, definitely your friends. But as some of you also get jobs, your employers and your boss are probably going to be a significant other as well as your coworkers. And speaking of employers, I'll use an example of mine. Mrs. Hafner, who is technically my boss, I care a lot about what she thinks of me. So I use the looking glass self process and every interaction that I have with Mrs. Hafner. And some of my other significant others that I've just included on this slide includes my parents here, some of my friends who are also my coworkers, as well as my husband.